welcome viewers to this set of lectures on historiography. You can either use either of the prepositions of or in early India. So, this is about the way in which early India or early Indian history has been written about across time and that is what historiography is all about. Very broadly you can understand it as the changing fashion of history writing about, uh, about uh, early India or ancient India, uh, that is what we are going to track. So, uh, as we begin it is important for us to make this distinction between history, historical sensibility and historiography. So, history is known to us uh, the way we go about studying our past uh, with whatever intent because it keeps changing. Uh, there is a particular way in which the mainstream history is done today in 21st century, maybe 20, 20th century, 19th century. It is a recent phenomena. The way we practice history today as a discipline, as a, uh, as a craft. Uh, is, is not very ancient because uh, this way of chronologically arranging events, uh, citing evidence uh, and then uh, trying to establish some kind of a causal connection between two events. So, this is the modern way in which we do history and uh, uh, all across time in ancient past or in medieval past uh, this uh, might not have been. Uh, the, the fashion of doing history or this might not have been the way in which people engaged with their past. So, that is history uh, as we practice it, uh, as we practice it, uh, it today and then we have historical sensibility. So, there are some, uh, there are some uh, you can say impulses about our past that we want to latch on to, that uh, we want to apprehend, that we want to have a grip on, that we want to memorize, that we want to be aware of or what we are cognizant of. So, historical sensibility is about being aware of uh, our past uh, or trying to be aware of our past, how, how we approach in, in preserving it or reckoning it. So, what are the methods by which uh, we, we reckon our past, uh, we record our past or we make sense of our past. So, broadly, very uh, broadly that is what historical sensibility is all about and uh, also that something that has, uh, that has survived despite the test of time for long. So, there is some kind of a uh, respect for that uh, because of its anteriority, because of its historical anteriority. So, that uh, to, uh, that in totality uh, uh, is what historical sensibility is all about, uh, being aware of uh, the, the timeline, being aware of the place where something has happened and having some kind of an uh, some kind of an objective view about it, some kind of a uh, critical assessment of past. So, all that, all that goes on to constitute what we broadly can say historical sensibility. And then we have historiography which is what we are doing today in this lecture, trying to understand the historiography uh, of ancient India or early India. Now, this historiography is how in ancient India people uh, reckoned their past or uh, did we care to, uh, to engage uh, in ancient India uh, with, with our past or how we recorded it uh, or uh, was it through oral tradition or was it through some other means that uh, history was reckoned with, uh, how concerned were we with the, uh, with the mundane aspect of our past. Uh, and uh, or is it that we, uh, we embedded historical sensibilities into a larger cosmological kind of engagement uh, with philosophy and so forth uh, or uh, we wrote poems and in between that we used some uh, historical uh, facts uh, within that. So, there can be several ways, there can be, uh, there can be a variety of ways in which uh, historical sensibility uh, might be present uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in people remembering their past, uh, 
uh, even in the ancient times or even in the medieval times. So, uh, that is that is again uh, something that we will be dealing with in today's lecture. Now, coming to the uh, present times as we began talking about it, I told you that uh, this present way of uh, understanding past with reference to chronological sequence of events with some causal connect and then the, the uh, fashion of, uh, uh, of citing evidence uh, as we make assertions, etc. So, this is, this is recent, this is uh, you can say that when the British administrative uh, officials uh, started uh, uh, ruling over India or uh, when they were, uh, when they were uh, confronted with the task of administering India, obviously they needed to engage with our past because it, it is on the basis of past traditions and customs and norms that they, uh, they, they had to dispense uh, justice or dispense administrative uh, responsibilities and so forth. There was no written constitution at that point of time, there was no singular book uh, that could serve as a penal code or something. So, th these are uh, these are all post uh, British arrival uh, developments that we saw and therefore, to begin with uh, they when they started looking at uh, our past uh, with, by, by studying some of the scriptures that the Pandits and the Maulavis here in the 18th century gave them or provided to them, uh, then the kind of uh, philosophical uh, exuberance with which uh, uh, detailing was uh, done in these texts or uh, you can say uh, the peripheral concern with uh, mundane affairs uh, of statecraft or economy or everyday life, uh, everyday concerns, military warfare, etc. Because because that was precisely what the British understood history as uh, in the 18th century and even uh, from their own viewpoint, even from the viewpoint of European practice, uh, this was a new way of uh, looking at past because it is a post enlightenment way of uh, doing history where you have to uh, accord factitude to your assertions, you have to appear as positivist as possible, as empirical as possible, you have to keep uh, aside, uh, then you have to reason out things, uh, there has to be some chronology of events and so forth, uh, all in the light of some evidence uh, which could be written or it could be uh, some material aspects of past, etc. So, when they did not uh, encounter these things, when they did not uh, uh, say got to uh, got to uh, find that there, uh, there are warfares also that kings are fighting, one king uh, is coming after some other king and then uh, those detailing, uh, those, uh, those uh, details are not there uh, or uh, dynastic uh, details are not there. So, initially the kind of texts that they were provided with, they did not come uh, across uh, 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 such references and therefore and therefore uh, a charge was labeled on uh, Indian past, particularly ancient Indian history that we did not have historical consciousness, that we did not have historical sensibility, we never cared about uh, recording our past, past does not, past did not mean much to us. Uh, this went well with the kind of strategy that uh, the British had uh, so far as colonial governance is concerned because they needed to, uh, the politics was uh, also crafted in such a way that uh, they needed to uh, deride our past uh, in the sense that uh, ours is a changeless kind of uh, uh, environment and it is the British, it is the arrival of the British that could accord dynamism to our society which had become very uh, decadent, moribund, uh, although uh, the oriental historians uh, who were looking at past also eulogized India's achievements in ancient past. So, it was a kind of uh, strategy where they said that look uh, you Indians had a glorious past, uh, but you have fallen to bad times in the 18th century and that is the time when uh, we are interested with the uh, task of administering over you, allow us to. Uh, to administer you, we will pull you out of this quagmire of uh, uh, of uh, decadence, and we will probably 
pull you out uh, to and, and uh, restore you to the position of that glory or that kind of a thing. So, it, it is with this intent that uh, they started viewing uh, writings uh, in India's past. So, it is a twin kind of a thing, they, they are uh, talking highly, the uh, oriental uh, historians are the orientalists uh, as I would say, are talking high of uh, ancient India's achievements, but at the same time they are trapped in the uh, or they are functioning in the colonial context, uh, where uh, they also have to uh, project that we have fallen into bad times and, uh, and therefore, uh, their uh, stay in India is very much required. So, there were several other trappings over it that we will uh, be talking about. So, uh, this charge, this charge of absence of uh, historical, con historical consciousness in early India partly emanated from post enlightenment European conceptualization of history, which I have already discussed with you uh, just now, uh, emphasis on chronology, evidence, causal connect, overall the positivist or Rankian way of doing history, where facts are to be accorded utmost importance and opinions are to be kept aside. So, trying to be as objective and scientific as possible, even in history writing. So, partly it is coming from this conceptualization with which the British are operating and since they did not find anything of this kind in early Indian texts, they are labeling the charge that ancient Indians did not bother much about history, which is wrong, we will discover how it is wrong. Partly this was also a colonial strategy as I was discussing with you, because 19th century is also a century of identity formation for the Orient with respect to the uh, uh, identity formation for the Occident that is the West with respect to the Orient that is us, uh, uh, Asians uh, uh, or Indians, Chinese, Japanese and so forth. Uh, there are several other uh, dimensions to it. Uh, wh why it is, why it is uh, a century of identity formation? Because for the first time they are encountering uh, for a long duration of time uh, what uh, Asian civilizations, old civilizations, remember Indian civilization or the Chinese civilization that they encounter in the 19th century are very ancient civilizations and they for, for the first time get to see, because so far they had seen uh, Americas, they had seen uh, uh, Africa, but uh, in Asia, uh, they were confronted with uh, civilizations that were much, much older than uh, their own European uh, civilization. So, uh, they uh, needed to identify themselves uh, with respect to what they saw here. So, they are uh, seeing us as the other. So, it is it's, it's, uh, the other image. Uh, that they have through which they are consolidating their own image. So, uh, they are everything what we are not uh, kind of a thing. So, uh, if, if their uh, conceptualization is that of a dynamic, then they have to label us as, uh, as slow, decadent uh, and so forth. So, uh, mirror opposite kind of a picturization that we get to see of the uh, orient uh, by the uh, orientalists or indologists. Now, at the same time, uh, this is also interesting that uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the administrative uh, uh, historians and officials uh, who we celebrate today as oriental, for example, William Jones. Uh, now, William Jones uh, is uh, pitching for, uh, for translations of uh, ancient Indian texts into English, which can, uh, uh, which can uh, help uh, the British administrative historians in governance and so forth. He is creating institutions like Asiatic Society of Bengal and creating institutions where the scholars, uh, Indian scholars can uh, come and uh, do these translations and uh, get uh, as many facts from India's past. So, he is appearing to be scientific, he is appearing to be modern, he is appearing to be, uh, to be uh, progressive here, but uh, the, the ambivalence is very evident in the fact that William Jones in European uh, context is uh, fighting some kind of a uh, idea war with Voltaire, who is uh, a renowned uh, enlightenment scholar scholar, uh, known for his scientific spirit and so forth, known for his scientific way of uh, and reasoned way of, uh, uh, of looking at things. 
and uh, uh, when William Jones is uh, speaking of the great flood having led to uh, uh, civilizational spurt and uh, is locating uh, the anteriority of European past in, uh, uh, in Christian theological details and when he encounters something of that sort in uh, Puran uh, in India. He is, uh, he is uh, talking uh, about it in European context that look from outside Christendom, I have discovered something uh, which is from Indian uh, ancient text, uh, similar references of great flood and so forth and therefore what is written in, uh, in Christian texts uh, is, is right. And Voltaire is not, uh, uh, not uh, caring much uh, about such assertions because of his scientific spirit and so forth. So just see the difference, I mean in India, William Jones is uh, seen as uh, a progressive uh, person with uh, uh, allowing reason uh, to, to, uh, to operate in scientific, in, uh, in historical inquiry and so forth. But uh, in his own uh, European context, he is pitched against Voltaire, uh, where Voltaire is the uh, uh, reasoned uh, or uh, he, he is the one who is talking of scientific spirit and so forth and William Jones is the one who is talking of uh, religion having all the details uh, about history uh, and, and so forth. So there is that kind of an uh, ambivalence that is also to be noted. So this picturization that I just told you about decadent east versus the dynamic west projection uh, and then also the uh, white man's burden uh, that is uh, the Christians there or the evangelicals there operating in uh, India in 19th century they, they think or uh, they think that uh, we uh, we have we are uh, we are the ones who need to be pulled out and uh, it, it is their uh, responsibility to civilize us and so forth. So all that uh, is, um, is coming from this identity formation that the Occident itself uh, is, is undergoing with respect to Orient or the Oriental uh, details that they get to see here in India. Now when we talk of uh, historiography of early India, of course there are two tangents to it. One is uh, as it progressed from the 19th century onwards uh, in the form of uh, the writings by Indologists, Orientalists uh, or imperial writings. So we have heard of uh, 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 James Mill, we have heard of Vincent Smith and so forth who are giving uh, uh, an imperial uh, uh, paint to, uh, to India's past. Uh, they are writing uh, with uh, chronology, they are writing with uh, uh, cause effect uh, kind of a format nevertheless uh, that gaze, that imperial gaze uh, with which they are looking at India is very evident even the politics of uh, uh, imperialism slash colonialism is very evident in that and uh, maybe uh, we, it, it comes in uh, the course of our discussion uh, subsequently. And then we have the nationalists, so from 1920s, 1930s uh, extending up to 1940s when we uh, acquired independence. So this, this is the time of intensive uh, struggle for Indian, uh, Indian independence and during this period the historians, uh, for example, uh, Rai Chaudhary, Altekar and so forth uh, uh, who are, uh, who are uh, writing about uh, India's past. Uh, they are imbued with the idea of uh, nationalism and they are taking on the imperial construct that uh, the imperial historians had uh, given to India's past and there is uh, a kind of uh, point to point uh, uh, rebuttal of uh, their assertion. So if they claim that uh, cradle of uh, democracy is Athens in Europe uh, belonging to the classical past of uh, Europe then the nationalist historians are asserting that uh, well uh, Indian past uh, uh, had uh, experienced uh, democracy much earlier, maybe centuries earlier in the form of Vaishali and so forth, the Ganaraj of Vaishali and so forth. So uh, the point is that th again when they are talking of uh, pan-India kind of British administrative system which perhaps eluded 
uh, India's past, uh, then they are making assertions that even during the Gupta period, even during the Mauryan period, uh, uh, India's, uh, India's administration was carried out at uh, almost the pan-Indian uh, level as it exists today, almost matching the British India or even, uh, even uh, bigger than that. So, uh, so uh, that kind of uh, uh, write, writing uh, is, is seen in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s and post the independence uh, when we became uh, a sovereign and uh, started our developmental course, then obviously some kind of a confidence had got into us and from the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Uh, you get to see that we also started looking at our own past uh, with a fair degree of uh, uh, critical gaze. So, we started critiquing our own uh, systems uh, that plagued uh, India's past. For example, caste system and there were several other uh, instances of uh, uh, asymmetries uh, that perhaps uh, uh, did not behove a uh, 20th century uh, sovereign nation, sovereign democratic nation and so forth. So all those things, uh, uh, all those things were emphasized in the Marxist writings uh, say of uh, D.D. Koshambi, R. S. Sharma, Romila Thapar and so forth, D. N. Jha etc. So, they are bringing out those aspects of India's past uh, and then uh, coming to the more, uh, more recent times uh, say 1980s, 1990s or maybe 1970s also uh, at the world stage we find postmodernism uh, coming up in a big way uh, which uh, did not uh, quite celebrate every aspect of uh, modern symbols or modern idioms or modern institutions. Uh, uh, for example, uh, say uh, big is beautiful, so uh, they start saying that small can also be beautiful. Uh, then a big nation state, then uh, they are uh, talking of uh, uh, fragmented uh, notion of uh, governance and so forth. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean uh, concentration of power in one authority is celebrated or uh, big uh, industries are celebrated as economic models in uh, modernity. Now, they are saying that there is no requirement for big uh, institutions of economy or governance. It can be scattered, it can be fragmented, it can be smaller. So, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, shade uh, or that disillusionment uh, with uh, the promises of modernity which is captured by postmodernist writings that is uh, partly, uh, partly evident uh, in several uh, not only Marxist historians but other historians also who are somewhat changing uh, their position from 1980s onwards here uh, in Indian history writing. And there is a spurt in writings around uh, regional histories or uh, for example, Mauryan state uh, in uh, ancient past uh, earlier, it was celebrated as a uh, hugely centralized bureaucratized kind of authoritative empire. Now, uh, they are taking positions that probably it was not as centralized, as authoritative or as uh, bureaucratic uh, as was earlier made out to be by the nationalist historians or even by the Marxist historians because they were taking on the imperial construct uh, and showing their own power and uh, uh, capacity to, to counter the imperial narrative. So, uh, that is one, that is one tangent of historiography that you get to see in terms of modern way of history writing. But, the, the other tangent uh, is history writing as practiced in early India. So, uh, how, how were the Mauryans looking at their past? Uh, how were the people living in Gupta period knew about their past? How were the people uh, living in, in Chola period uh, look at their past? And did they care to look at their past? Did they care to record their past? And if they did, what are the ways and means uh, by which they, they did so? So, that is the second tangent of, uh, of uh, history writing uh, that we get to see uh, as part of historiography. So, as we uh, 
proceed uh, further, maybe in the next part of this lecture, uh, we shall try to capture this particular aspect, second aspect. First aspect we have already discussed that post independence, what are the historiographical trends uh, related to uh, ancient India and uh, what are the attributes what are the characteristic features, what are the circumstances under which it emerged and in the next part of the lecture, we shall try to track what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, reckoning uh, people in past had uh, about their own histories. Uh, how did they uh, deal with their own history, how did they, uh, uh, they negotiate with their own past. So, that is yet another aspect or yet another tangent of historiography that we shall try to uh, track in next part of this lecture. Thank you.